Hello and welcome to the 80s Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens, publisher and editor of FilmJerk.com. Thank you for listening today. If you like what you hear and you haven't done so already, please make sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcatching source. While a good review and rating won't increase our chances of being found or being a featured podcast, on a podcatcher like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, it will potentially help increase the odds of someone who does find the show for the first time thinking that clicking play will be a good time investment for them. And it's something you can even do while you're listening to this episode. On this episode, we set our sights on Peter Bogdanovich and his 1981 film, They All Laughed. I originally planned this episode to be the first episode of 2022, but as I was getting close to finishing the writing of the episode, Peter Bogdanovich passed away, and out of respect for the filmmaker, I held the episode until now. For those of you who were not familiar with who Peter Bogdanovich was, here's a short primer. Born about an hour and a half north of New York City in 1939, Bogdanovich made it his own destiny to be involved in cinema any way he could. When he was just 12 years old, shortly after his family moved to the Big Apple, he would start cataloging every movie he watched on 4 by 6 index cards, the name of the movie, the year it was released, who directed it, and, most importantly, a capsule review of the film. And if he watched the movie again a few years later, he'd leave an updated review under his original thoughts, and he'd do this for every film he saw, upward of 400 movies a year, for more than 20 years. By the time he graduated from high school in 1957, he had already started to study acting with the legendary Stella Adler, and appeared in a New York Shakespeare Festival production of Othello. Two years later, Bogdanovich would be hand-selected by the playwright Clifford Odets to direct and star in an off-Broadway production of the writer's drama about Hollywood, The Big Knife. Bogdanovich would raise the $15,000 it would cost to stage the show, and he would receive strong notices from the local press. He would direct a few more off-Broadway shows until he became a film programmer at the Museum of Modern Art, where he would program the first serious retrospects of such filmmakers as John Ford, Howard Hawks, Alfred Hitchcock, and Orson Welles, as well as program the New Yorker Theater, the influential Upper West Side movie house where many of the biggest foreign films of the day would first open in the United States. Bogdanovich would also become a film critic around this time, writing for Esquire, the Saturday Evening Post, and Cahiers du Cinema the French film magazine where filmmakers Claude Chabral, Jean-Luc Godard, Eric Romer, and Francois Truffaut all got their starts in the film industry as critics. Their articles about the auteur theory and their starting the French cinema new wave in the early 60s would inspire Bogdanovich to become a filmmaker himself. As he worked out how he was going to break into filmmaking and program two movie theaters and write movie reviews for multiple magazines, he would also find time in 1962 to get married to Polly Platt, a costume designer he had met while working in Summerstock Theater. In 1966, Bogdanovich and Platt would move from New York to Los Angeles. He would use his connections as a film critic to get invitations to movie premieres and industry-related parties. At one such screening, the couple would find themselves seated in front of film producer and director Roger Corman, whose cheapy horror films had turned the B-movie company American Independent Pictures into one of the biggest non-studio distributors around. Corman had recognized Bogdanovich as the writer of an article in Esquire he had really liked. The two struck up a conversation that, by the end of the evening, found Corman offering Bogdanovich the chance to direct a movie, which Bogdanovich would be able to stretch into two films. The first, Voyage to the Planet of Prehistoric Women, would be a great way for the newly minted film director to learn his craft. Corman had purchased a 1962 Russian science fiction movie called Planet of Storms a few years after it was released in Europe and Asia. Corman was originally planning to just dub it into English, but his boss at AIP, Samuel Z. Arkoff, wouldn't release it without some good old-fashioned American TNA added in. Polly Platt would work as the production designer for the new footage, which would be shot at Leo Carrillo Beach outside Malibu. 
overall, they would shoot about 10 minutes of footage, which would be added into the film, not unlike how Joseph E. Levine would add new footage into Godzilla when he brought it to America in the mid-1950s. Bogdanovich would not take a director's credit for the film since he had done so little work on it, calling himself Derek Thomas, but he would give himself credit for the narration he would record for the film to try and make the obviously different footages work together. The second film would be a a bit more challenging. After starring in a number of films produced and directed by Roger Corman in the early and mid-1960s, horror film icon Boris Karloff still owed Corman two days of work. Corman would tell Bogdanovich and Platt that they could literally make any movie they wanted as long as they kept the budget under $130,000 and fully utilized those two days of filming Karloff. That was still owed. The couple went home and started to come up with ideas. They would come up with two unrelated stories that would come together at the end in an unexpected way. The first story would feature Karloff as an actor, once famed for his roles in horror films of the 1930s, who has decided to retire from the business and return to his home in England. The actor feels that times have changed and that people are no longer affected by the kind of horror that was his bread and butter for decades and that the horror of the current news cycles were more horrifying than anything that could appear in one of his films. However, thanks to a young filmmaker's insistence, the actor agrees to make one final promotional appearance at a drive-in outside Los Angeles before leaving for good. The second story would be inspired by Charles Whitman, a former Marine who had killed 15 people and injured 31 others during a 95-minute shooting spree atop the main building tower at the University of Texas in Austin in August of 1966. Here, a former Vietnam veteran murders several members of his family at his house before going on a shooting spree around the San Fernando Valley that ends up with him at the same drive-in, at the same time, as the retiring actor. Bogdanovich had, by early 1967, befriended Sam Fuller, the legendary director of such movies as Shock Corridor and The Naked Kiss, and he would work extensively with Bogdanovich and Platt on the story for the film, which would be entitled Targets. And because he liked the couple, Fuller would neither accept payment nor credit for his work. Targets would film in the late fall of 1967, and Bogdanovich would spend the rest of the year and the early part of 1968 editing the film together. And in classic Corman style, Bogdanovich would repurpose clips from Corman's 1963 thriller The Terror, featuring Karloff and Corman regulars Dick Miller and Jack Nicholson, into his film. American International Pictures was keen on releasing the film as part of their contract with Corman, but Bogdanovich asked them to see if they could try and make a deal with one of the major studios first. Robert Evans, the then vice president of production at Paramount Pictures, would see the film and buy it for the studio for $150,000, giving Corman an instant profit of $20,000 before even a single ticket had been sold. But between the time the movie was made and sold, and the time it would be released in the theaters in August of 1968, the world had dramatically changed. The country was still dealing with the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. in April and Bobby Kennedy in June. The film wouldn't be a huge success, but it would get Bogdanovich noticed in Hollywood, and it would set him up for the success he would enjoy in the early 1970s. Now, normally I would spend some time here talking about the making of his next few films, the ones that would make him a filmmaking icon, but I don't write my scripts for these shows linearly, and as I write this section, I'm already looking at an episode that's going to be more than an hour long, so I'm going to briefly cover this section of his life and career. After the relative success of Targets, it would take Bogdanovich nearly three years to get his next film off the ground. And during that time, Bogdanovich and Platt would double the size of their family, with daughter Antonia arriving in November of 1967 and daughter Sashi in September 1970. In 1970, Bogdanovich would start co-writing a screenplay, adapted from the novel The Last Picture Show by Larry McMurtry. The story of two high school seniors and the people living in their small Texas town was a semi-autobiographical story by McMurtry, 
And Bogdanovich's movie would feature some of the best young actors in Hollywood, including Timothy Bottoms and Jeff Bridges as the best friends, Randy Quaid and Ellen Burstyn, and Sybil Shepard, a model churn actress for whom this would be her first major film role. The movie would also feature legendary cowboy actor Ben Johnson and Cloris Leachman. The $1.3 million film would be a major critical and box office success, grossing more than $29 million. And the film would be nominated for eight Academy Awards, including two for Bogdanovich as director and co-writer. Both Ben Johnson and Cloris Leachman would win in their respective supporting acting categories. Like on targets, Polly Platt would only hold one official credit, this time as costume designer, but she would help McMurtry and her husband write the screenplay, and she would act as an unofficial producer. But unlike on targets, she would discover, while she was pregnant with her second child with her husband, that he was having an affair with his leading lady, Sybil Shepard. Shortly after she gave birth to Sashi, the two would split up, and Shepard would move in with Bogdanovich at his new mansion. But even though she was divorcing her husband, Platt would continue to work with him. On this next film, the screwball comedy What's Up Doc, featuring Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill, Platt would pull double duty as both the production designer and the costume designer, while also acting as her soon-to-be ex's right-hand person. Originally conceived as a comedy for Streisand's ex-husband, Elliot Gould, and Kim Darby, the $4 million What's Up Doc would gross more than $66 million at the box office in 1972, opening not five months after the last picture show had opened in theaters. Platt would also be responsible for helping Bogdanovich pick his next film, Paper Moon. Originally scheduled to be directed by John Huston and star Paul Newman and his daughter Nell, the Depression-era comedy drama would star Ryan O'Neill and, at the suggestion of Platt, O'Neill's eight-year-old daughter Tatum, who had never acted before. The movie would be a third success in a row for Bogdanovich, grossing nearly $31 million off a $2.5 million budget, and it would be nominated for four Academy Awards. Tatum O'Neill would win for Best Supporting Actress at the age of 10, which to this day still makes her the youngest person to ever win a competitive Oscar. But Platt would not join her ex-husband for his next film, a drama called Daisy Miller whose title character would be played by the director's girlfriend, Sybil Shepard, who had been wise enough to stay away from the sets of What's Up Doc and Paper Moon while Platt was around. Bogdanovich had recently started a production company at Paramount called The Director's Company, along with Francis Ford Coppola and William Friedkin, at the behest of Paramount owner Charles Bloodhorn, who gave the three men unlimited freedom to make whatever they wanted as long as the budget was under $3 million and Paper Moon had been the first film made under that pact. Coppola would make his brilliant 1974 movie The Conversation for the director's company, and Daisy Miller, at a budget of $2.5 million, would be the third film for the company. It would be Orson Welles, who Bogdanovich had befriended years earlier, who would suggest the director make a movie based on the Henry James novel, as a love letter to the director's lovely lady. But Shepard was not a good enough actress to play the role and she looked out of place next to real actors like Cloris Leachman and Eileen Brennan. The film would not even make its budget back, and its failure would kill off the director's company before Friedkin even had a chance to make a movie for them. 1975's musical At Long Last Love was another critical and commercial dud for Mr. Bogdanovich, pairing the non-existent singing talents of Miss Shepard and Burt Reynolds with the tunes of one of the 20th century's greatest songwriters, Cole Porter. The $5 million film could barely make half its budget back. 1976's Nickelodeon, produced by Erwin Winkler and Robert Chartoff, would make it three in a row for Bogdanovich and Bombs, but its failure would be little noticed, thanks in large part to the success of the other film Winkler and Chartoff had in theaters at the same time. You may have heard of it. Rocky? It was also around this time that Bogdanovich would sue Universal Pictures for what he felt was a breach of an oral contract he thought he made with the studio to produce and direct a movie based on the life of notorious gangster Bugsy Siegel. When the movie was finally made in 1991, 
Barry Levinson would be the director, and Levinson would co-produce the film with star Warren Beatty. Bogdanovich would get a minor reprise from the critics for 1979's St. Jack, a crime drama with Ben Gazzara he would shoot in Singapore, but at the box office it would be the fourth strike in a row. And if that wasn't bad enough, it would also be around this time that his relationship with Sybil Shepherd would come to an end. Peter Bogdanovich was at a crossroads in his career. He had been a successful filmmaker at the start of the decade, having directed three big hit films which had combined been nominated for 12 Academy Awards. And together, those three films had a gross of about $125 million, or about $754 million in 2022 money. But he was coming off four flops in a row. He needed a hit, and he felt he had a really good idea for a film. What if there were some private detectives in New York City, different ages and different backgrounds, who specialized in following married women whose husbands suspected them of having an affair, and one of them would end up falling in love with the woman he was tailing? Bogdanovich knew he wanted to work with his friend Ben Gazzara again, and he knew he wanted to work with Audrey Hepburn and with John Ritter, who had been briefly featured in Nickelodeon before he became a star on ABC's sitcom Three's Company. But he didn't like any of the actresses he was testing for a crucial role of Dolores, the character that Ritter's character would be following. Enter Dorothy Stratton. Born Dorothy Hoog Stratton in Vancouver, British Columbia in 1960, she was a good student in high school who worked at a local Dairy Queen. When she was 17, she would meet a two-bit local hustler named Paul Snyder when he walked into her ice cream parlor for a strawberry sundae. Despite warnings from her friends and family, Dorothy and Snyder would become a couple. She was beautiful and smart, if more than a bit naive, and he was a wispy little punk. Shortly after she turned 18, Snyder was able to convince Dorothy to pose nude for some pictures that he wanted to submit to Playboy magazine, which was in the middle of a heavily publicized search for their 25th anniversary playmate. The prize money and other swag for being named the anniversary playmate was more than she had ever dreamed of making, and Dorothy would pose for the photos. Snyder would get them developed as quickly as possible and have them rush delivered to the Playboy corporate offices in Los Angeles. As soon as Playboy Vice President Marilyn Grabowski saw the pictures of Dorothy, she would get up from her desk and head over to her boss's office. Hugh Hefner had seen thousands of photos from hopefuls, and he was just about ready to make his decision when Grabowski handed him the photos of Dorothy. Within an hour, Dorothy was on the phone with Playboy, making arrangements to be flown to Los Angeles to meet Hef and Grabowski and have a photo session with the magazine's lead photographer at the time, Mario Casilli. Although Hef's deadline to make a decision was looming large, Dorothy quickly became a part of the short list of 16 ladies he considered were in the running. She would quickly and briefly return to Vancouver to collect her things. She would be moving to Los Angeles at least for the time being, as she pursued the possibility of becoming a playmate. And she would soon have a new name, Dorothy Stratton. Snyder would soon move to Los Angeles himself, worried that her career would take off without him. He may have loved her, but she was, more importantly to him, his e-ticket to financial stability and respectability. It would be at the 1978 Halloween party at the Playboy Mansion where Peter Bogdanovich would meet Dorothy Stratton for the first time. Bogdanovich and Hefner had been friends for years, and Bogdanovich was a regular at the Playboy Mansion, although the debonair and sophisticated filmmaker would never partake of the more lascivious activities that would happen around the house. One thing was clear to many people at the party that night. Everyone there who met Paul Snyder was not impressed with him. Hef would even go so far as to tell Dorothy he felt Snyder had a certain pimp-like quality, which wouldn't be that far off. Before meeting Dorothy, Snyder had actually worked as a pimp in Vancouver. She apparently was not aware of this part of her boyfriend's life. Eventually, Hefner would come to his decision and choose a young lady named Candy Loving to be the 25th anniversary playmate. And yes, Believe it or not, 
Candy Loving was her real name. Heff had decided that Dorothy would instead be the Playmate of the Month in the August 1979 issue and would put her to work as a bunny at the Los Angeles chapter of the Playboy Club. When she wasn't working, she was taking acting classes in Sherman Oaks. And it wouldn't be long before she was offered her first movie roles. First, a cameo as a Playboy bunny in a John Ritter comedy called Americathon, then as a girl at a snack bar in the Scott Bale movie Skate Town USA, and finally her first major role as a kidnapping victim in a Canadian soft porn movie called Autumn Born. Dorothy would follow those up with an appearance on the popular ABC TV show Fantasy Island, and all of these roles would be booked and shot before her Playmate pictorial was even published. Shortly after that pictorial came out, the Playboy offices were bombarded with letters from readers, male and female, praising Dorothy. She would quickly book a guest role on the new NBC TV show Buck Rogers in the 25th century. But her life would change in October 1979 when, while at the Playboy Mansion one night, she would be reintroduced to Bogdanovich in the front foyer. The two would strike up a conversation where she would tell Bogdanovich all about the roles she had played in the year since they first met. And he was smitten with her. Even without makeup, she was stunningly beautiful. And then something clicked in his head. Maybe this young lady would be right for one of the smaller roles in the film. He would mention to Dorothy he was leaving soon to shoot a movie in New York City, and he would like to have her come to his home office in the near future to read for one of the roles. But he couldn't get her out of his head, even after learning she was newly married. Bogdanovich would just keep showing up at the mansion whenever he knew that Dorothy would be there, and he would try to find any reason just to speak to her again. Later that week, Dorothy and her agent would arrive at Bogdanovich's house, and as she entered the opulently furnished Bel Air mansion, she reflected on just how much her life had changed in the year since she acquiesced to having those first photos taken of her. Dorothy would be led to the director's office, and he would enter a moment later. She would be reading for a minor but significant role as the secretary of the private detectives, but as she did her reading with the director, he realized he wasn't just smitten with her, but he was falling in love hard. Shortly after she left, Bogdanovich would start to rewrite the screenplay for his new movie, looking to beef up the role of the secretary any way he could. After a few days, he realized there wasn't really a whole lot of expansion for that character, so he would instead change one of the already existing characters to better fit Dorothy and her personality. The part John Ritter would be playing was a smaller role due to his commitment to Three's Company, and his character was supposed to be pretty much gone partway through the first act of the film. He would be following a 30-something woman at the start of the film. He would uncover her affair, that case would be over, and he would be gone. A setup for how different things would be for Ben Gazzara's character, and how his character interacts with Audrey Hepburn's. Now, their two stories, Gazzara and Hepburn's, and Ritter and Dorothy's would mirror each other throughout the entire film. Ritter would need to work with the producers of Three's Company to take on an expanded role in the film, but the expansion of the Ritter and Dorothy characters would need to be balanced by removing scenes featuring Gazzara and Hepburn, which would cause problems between Bogdanovich and Gazzara once the actor read the new script. When Dorothy read the new script, she realized a good portion of the new lines for her expanded role were based on things people in and around the Playboy universe were telling Bogdanovich about her husband. Things she already knew about Snyder and the feelings, unbeknownst to Bogdanovich, she was having about her new marriage to her husband. But there would be another reason why Dorothy was nervous during the reading at the director's house. Her husband was in the driveway, in the car she had purchased for him, a brand new Mercedes-Benz with a vanity plate especially chosen by Snyder for what he was predicting for her. Star 80. Before they would head off to New York to shoot They All Laughed in March, Dorothy had another movie to shoot, a lower-budget sci-fi comedy, in which she would play the title character, Galaxina, a sexy android who learns to become more human-like, while her human crew is kept cryogenically frozen for a long trip through space. 
She didn't particularly want to do that movie, but her husband was pressuring her to strike while her iron was hot. There was a very good chance she would be named the 1980 Playmate of the Year, and the movie was already scheduled to be released weeks after she would be named the Playmate of the Year, if she did indeed get named Playmate of the Year. Forget the fact that the movie hadn't even started shooting yet, and the Playmate of the Year issue would be arriving on newsstands in less than six months. But she did the movie, and Snyder would be there on set every day, making life miserable for his wife and for the other cast and crew. Once the film was completed and she returned to Los Angeles, she and Bogdanovich would find ways to steal time without arousing too much suspicion from her already suspicious and paranoid husband. But there was a real bond there between the director and his soon-to-be star. He would even introduce Dorothy to his two daughters, 12-year-old Antonia and 9-year-old Sashi, and the three ladies would play around like forever friends. But Bogdanovich started to worry about what was happening between them. Even as the director started to dream of a life with his new star, he was worried that she never mentioned leaving her husband, even as she aired grievances against him to her new paramour. The matter wasn't helped when a house guest, who would also be working as a producer on the film, mentioned his worries that the director might have been being railroaded by Hefner and Dorothy's business manager and agent, all who would profit from Dorothy becoming a movie star. Hef especially was eager to have a magazine bathed in the glow of having helped to create another movie star, the way Hef thought he had with Marilyn Monroe and Jane Mansfield. Bogdanovich would call Dorothy, who was at one of the Playboy photo studios, taking pictures for what would become her Playmate of the Year pictorial, and issue a sort of ultimatum. He wanted her in the film, and he wanted her in his life. Whatever she decided he would live with, but she would need to make a decision. Did she want to be with him or Snyder? Dorothy was floored by the call and couldn't continue with the photo shoot. She thought Bogdanovich was saying goodbye. The director would call Dorothy the next day to apologize for his behavior over the phone the previous day. He explained all the pressures he was under getting the film ready for production and what his houseguest had said a few days earlier. She assured him that none of that was true. But he still needed to know. Him or Snyder? She wasn't ready to make that decision yet. She would need some time. And until she flew to New York City in mid-March to begin production on the film, the two hardly saw each other. She continued to do her publicity work for Playboy, and he would finish his rewrites and finish casting. But there was one thing he was sure about. Paul Snyder could not be on the set in New York City. The director would send out a decree to the cast and major crew. The movie would be shot on a closed set, and there would be absolutely no visitors allowed. When Snyder protested to Dorothy that he wanted to be in New York with her, she was ready with Bogdanovich's edict. Snyder reluctantly drove his wife to LAX and put her on the plane to New York. Bogdanovich would be waiting for Dorothy at JFK in New York, and although they were staying at different hotels two blocks away, Dorothy would soon be staying with Bogdanovich every night after their first night in town. Production would begin at the end of March, and the production would be somewhat problematic. Not only did the director and actress need to keep their romance on the down low, a number of people involved in the film were upset at how much the rewritten script deviated from the original script that got so many of them involved in the first place. Outside of Gazzara, who was seeing his first chance at a substantial leading role in Years Shrink, the producer for the production company Time Life Films was not ready for the kind of film the director wanted to make. Working with Dutch cinematographer Robbie Mueller, who had shot a number of Wim Wenders' German movies in the 1970s, Bogdanovich didn't want to shoot They All Laughed like a conventional Hollywood film. He wanted the film to feel alive, like the viewer was an active participant in everything that was happening on screen. That kind of filmmaking, with the camera not locked down and just freely moving around, is commonplace in 2022, but in 1980 it was still a revolutionary concept, one that very much put the producers on edge. 
Some of the younger actors loved working with Peter Bogdanovich. Colleen Camp, who after years of small roles was getting her first big co-starring role as a country singer involved with the Gazara's Married Detective, loved it when Bogdanovich would hand her a newly rewritten scene just before cameras were to roll, allowing her and her co-stars to be spontaneous with their characters. Ritter would have one of his best scenes in the film when his director told him how they were about to change the scene they were going to film inside the bar at the famed Algonquin Hotel. Ritter's character was just supposed to watch Dorothy's character from across the bar. But just before cameras were set to roll, the director stepped in to let Ritter know that something different was about to happen. What do I say when it happens, asked the actor. Whatever comes to your head, came the response. Something Ritter was not expecting from the person who had also written the screenplay. A waiter at the bar would interrupt Ritter while he was watching Dorothy, and their improvisation would not only delight the director, it would become one of the most memorable moments in the film. Bogdanovich and Dorothy tried to hide their relationship as best they could, but they would be caught together by an agent from the William Morris Agency while walking through Central Park during an off day from shooting. Thankfully, word of what was happening didn't filter out of New York. The rest of the cast knew. Most of the crew knew. And while that might have triggered some to be extra nice to her to butter up to the director, most people genuinely liked Dorothy. She was quiet and reserved while waiting for her moments on the set. She read classic novels suggested to her by Bogdanovich, and she wrote poetry in her spare time. Even Audrey Hepburn was impressed with Dorothy, the Oscar winner and fashion icon finding her co-star to be like an angel. Dorothy seemed to be handling herself very well although she would suffer from frequent migraines during the shoot, especially after calls from a frantic Snyder on the other side of the country demanding to know when his wife was coming home. She would get some relief when she needed to leave New York for a couple of weeks to return to Vancouver for her mother's wedding and to do a short publicity tour for Playboy. She would return to New York for more shooting, but at the end of April, she needed to head back to Los Angeles where Hefner would host a press conference at the Playboy Mansion announcing her as the Playmate of the Year. She would spend time with her husband while she was in town, but she knew it was over for them. Snyder seemed to know it, too. When she returned to New York in late May, after finishing her promotional tour as the Playmate of the Year, which included an appearance on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, Dorothy would learn that Snyder had cleared their joint bank account of more than $15,000. That would be the last straw for Dorothy. She was determined to end her marriage with Snyder, and Bogdanovich dreamed of a future with her. Just as the film completed production in July, two things would happen nearly simultaneously that would hamper the film and its director. First, Time Life Films decided to get out of the film business, citing the poor performance of their first two films they produced, both which would be released by 20th Century Fox. The 1980 Jack Smite-directed Loving Couples, an unfunny and unromantic romantic comedy which featured Shirley MacLaine and James Coburn as a married couple who begin an affair with another couple, played by Susan Sarandon and Stephen Collins. And the 1981 Daniel Petrie-directed cop drama Fort Apache the Bronx, starring Paul Newman, Ed Asner, and Ken Wall. And while it's true that Loving Couples was a disaster, grossing a little over $2.8 million against a $9 million budget, Ford Apache the Bronx was anything but a bomb. The $10 million production would gross over $29 million, but for whatever reason, Time Life pulled the plug on their operation and would be out of the movie business once They All Laughed was released. As I mentioned a moment ago, Dorothy returned to Los Angeles once filming ended to end things once and for all with Snyder. She was clandestinely living with Bogdanovich at his estate, and with the somewhat successful release of Galaxina, in the first part of its regional release, her star was very much on the rise. Snyder, as a Canadian national living in the United States without a green card, could not legally work in the country, and his only source of income had just told him she wanted a divorce. Unable to get a face-to-face meeting with Dorothy, 
Snyder would hide just outside Bogdanovich's estate on July 31st, a borrowed handgun in his pocket, ready to shoot his estranged wife and her new boyfriend if they came out the front door. After waiting for several hours without any movement in or out of the house, Snyder would leave the area and, before returning home, went up to the Hollywood Hills and considered suicide. A week later, Dorothy would finally meet with Snyder, just the two of them, at their house. Snyder was confident he could talk his wife out of leaving him, but he was quite wrong. Dorothy would tell Snyder in no uncertain terms that their marriage was over, that she was in love with Bogdanovich, and that she wanted to finalize their separation. But she assured him that they would meet again a few days later to discuss the settlement of their finances. Snyder, who had to return the gun he borrowed, would spend the next few days trying to acquire another one. He couldn't legally buy a gun at a gun store because he was not an American citizen nor had a green card. The private detective he had hired to follow Dorothy and Bogdanovich around refused to buy him a gun. And he would get lost in the San Fernando Valley when he went to look for a gun he had found in a newspaper classified ad. Finally, on August 13th, he would buy a 12-gauge pump shotgun from a private seller he had found in another classified ad. The next day, Dorothy would meet with her business manager about how she should proceed with the divorce. The manager would give Dorothy $1,100 to offer Snyder as a down payment for future monies that would come from the divorce settlement. And once again, she would meet with Snyder at their house alone. Against the advice of Bogdanovich and her business manager, both suggested she should just allow her lawyer to handle the affairs. But she was adamant that things would go easier if she dealt with Snyder herself. By this time, Snyder had taken in a couple of roommates to help pay for rent. They would leave the house before Dorothy arrived. By the time they returned to the house between 7 and 8 p.m., they noticed Dorothy's car was still parked out front and that the door to Snyder's bedroom was closed. Presuming the couple had reconciled, they would sit on the couch in the living room and watch TV until around 11 o'clock. They would get a call from Snyder's private eye, worried about his client. The roommates would enter the bedroom and find Snyder and Dorothy dead, each killed by a single blast from Snyder's shotgun. Snyder had shot Dorothy within an hour of her arrival at the house and then taken his own life an hour later. If you want to learn more about the death of Dorothy Stratton, there are plenty of resources you can find that will get into the grisly details and the hyperbolic conjecture of what may or may not have happened that day. I'm not going there. It would be Playboy publisher Hugh Hefner, who would call his friend Peter Bogdanovich shortly after midnight on the 15th to inform him of what had happened. Bogdanovich was understandably devastated, and he would need to be sedated for most of the day. In a strange twist of fate, August 15th was also the day Dorothy's new film, Galaxina, would open in theaters across Los Angeles. Dorothy would be cremated and her ashes interred at Westwood Memorial Park, not too far from where Marilyn Monroe had been laid to rest. Her death would also cause a fracture in the friendship between the filmmaker and the Playboy publisher, but we'll get to that later. For weeks, Bogdanovich would not see or speak to anyone, not his two daughters, not his ex-wife, not any of his friends in the industry. He would hole himself up in his editing bay, running every take of every scene with Dorothy over and over and over again, realizing she was actually really good in the film and realizing this could have been the start of a real acting career. Or maybe it was the manifestation of his grief the loss of someone he came to care for so very deeply in such a short time. Maybe he was going mad, but he knew that he would have to keep going for her sake, to show the world what she could have been. And that drive would help bring Bogdanovich back from the brink of madness. In the weeks and months after her death, Bogdanovich would constantly be reminded of Dorothy. First, it was the articles in the daily newspapers and the weekly news magazines, which spoke of her as little more than a sexual fantasy girl on the pages of a nudie magazine. Heff would write a tribute to her in the pages of his magazine. Then MGM Studios and the NBC Television Network 
announced a docudrama about her life called Death of a Centerfold, produced by Larry Wilcox, the other guy from the TV show Chips who wasn't Eric Estrada. Jamie Lee Curtis would be cast as Dorothy, and Bruce White's not yet cast as one of the stars of Hill Street Blues would play Snyder. And then Bob Fosse, the director of such films as Cabaret and All That Jazz, would announce he would be making his own movie about Dorothy's murder for Warner Brothers, an adaptation of a Village Voice article by Teresa Carpenter that had appeared in November of 1980, which Fosse read at the recommendation of his friend, network screenwriter Patty Chayefsky. Bogdanovich was incensed at the makers of both films, and he threatened to sue either production if they used his name or anything resembling him in their productions. But these intrusions into his life and Dorothy's would give him a new purpose. He would, once he was finished putting the film together, write a book about Dorothy, her life, her character, her love of life, and their time together. He would title the book The Killing of the Unicorn, and he would continually travel between Los Angeles and Vancouver to learn more about Dorothy from her mother Nellie, her half-sister Louise, and her friends. Bogdanovich would finish editing They All Laughed in late 1980, and 20th Century Fox would set up a test screening of the film outside Miami. But the filmmaker was worried. The company that was recruiting the audience was telling people it was an Audrey Hepburn movie instead of telling them it was an ensemble cast that included Audrey Hepburn. And the theater they booked was not near the University of Miami, as Bogdanovich had requested, but one that was near a number of senior retirement centers. But the test screening went rather well, or at least for the first hour it did. Thanks to the comments from the audience, Bogdanovich realized he needed to change the pace of the second half of the film, and within a week he would remove about 15 minutes from the final film, while adding in another minute and a half of scenes with Dorothy in it. Fox was not all that sold on the film, so they would decide a year after Dorothy's death to give the movie a three-city test run in Minneapolis, Phoenix, and Providence, Rhode Island, beginning August 21, 1981. Two days before the opening, a critic for the Hollywood trade publication Variety would give the film a rave review, calling it Bogdanovich's best film to date, and thus was deserving of careful nurturing with critical support. The critic, however, would note the eerie similarities between Dorothy's storyline where her character's new husband hires a detective to follow her around because he's worried she's cheating on him, and Snyder's hiring of a private detective to follow his new wife around because he was worried she was cheating on him. From one theater each in those three markets, they all laugh would gross about $30,000. In week two, the film would lose only about a third of its audience, and another third in week three, and another third in week four. After that, the film would be pulled from theaters with a gross of less than $75,000, and with that, any chances of a further release were off the table at Fox. Bogdanovich was, for a lack of a better word, pissed. Three screens and out to his love letter to his lost angel? To be relegated to whatever cable channel or videotape distributor who might be willing to throw some meager coinage their way? He was not going to have that. He was not going to allow some money men in Century City decide the fate of his film. So he would make the most compulsive decision of his life. He was going to buy the film back from Time Life Films, form his own distribution company, and release the movie himself. Fox was on board. They hadn't financed the film, so they didn't really have that much to lose. In fact, they'd let the film rights revert back to Time Life for half a million dollars. Bogdanovich would be on the hook for that. And then Bogdanovich would have to agree to pay Time Life back the negative cost of the film, $7.5 million, plus the interest already accrued on the film sitting on the proverbial shelf for a year from any future earnings from the film before Time Life would agree to give the movie to its director. A few days later, Peter Bogdanovich would incorporate Moon Pictures as his distribution company. He would spend the next two months learning everything he could about distributing his own film, 
hiring a staff to book the movie into theaters, to get posters and trailers shipped out, to hire a publicist to promote the movie to critics who hadn't seen the movie when Fox was still handling it. When They All Laughed finally opened in New York City on Friday, November 20th, 1981, Bogdanovich was able to play it in two of the more prestigious art house cinemas in town, the Cinema Studio One and the Lincoln Plaza One, which goes to show just how much pull the Bogdanovich name still had with some art house programmers, still hoping the director would be able to bring in the audiences the way they came for The Last Picture Show and What's Up Doc and Paper Moon. Many critics would be kind. Jack Kroll of Newsweek would call the film a movie of irrepressible romantic sweetness, while Andrew Saris of The Village Voice would somewhat echo the sentiment, saying it was an extraordinary sweet and generous romantic fantasy, comparing it to the works of Ernst Lubitsch, Max Ophel's La Rome, and Stolen Kisses, the second Francois Truffaut film to feature his most enduring character, Antoine Donier. There would also be positive notices from Rex Reed, Judith Christ, and from Cosmopolitan and Us magazines. On the opposite side of the spectrum, Vincent Canby, the lead film critic for the New York Times, did spend some of his review complimenting some of the younger cast, including Colleen Camp, model churn actress Patty Henson, and Dorothy. But Canby's overall view of the film was that it was an immodest disaster, aggressive in its ineptitude, and grading in a way of playing a 78 RPM record at 33 RPM would be. Canby would compliment Bogdanovich for being able to cast a bevy of beautiful women, but would call the screenplay cheerless and witless, and the direction to be somewhat frantic and lethargic at the same time. But Bogdanovich's fans would show up for the film in its opening week to a certain degree. Between the two theaters, the film would gross $28,600, and in its second week, Thanksgiving weekend, that would rise to $30,700. But after the holiday, the film would start to sink. And despite the fact that the 1981 post-Thanksgiving season would be one full of big films like Absence of Malice, Chariots of Fire, On Golden Pond, Reds, Taps, and Time Bandits, they All Laugh was able to hang on to both theaters for six weeks until the cinema studio would bring Bruce Beresford's Australian war drama Breaker Morant back after nearly six months after it left theaters. In an attempt to capitalize on the success of Peter Weir's Australian war drama Gallipoli, which had been released into American theaters to great success back in August, but it would last at the Lincoln Plaza until New Year's Eve. The film would also open in four theaters in Kansas City, Missouri, and single theaters in Nashville and Scottsdale on November 20th, after a benefit premiere for the film in Nashville on November 18th. The film would also open at the Baghdad Theater in Portland, Oregon on November 27th, in Seattle and Vancouver, British Columbia on December 11th, and at the Music Hall Theater in Beverly Hills and the Bristol Theater in Santa Ana on December 18th. Bogdanovich would open up seats to any Academy member to come see the film for free. But there are no records of how many took him up on his offer. When the nominations were announced for the films of 1981, they all laughed would not receive a single nomination. And after three months in theaters, the film would barely miss the half-million-dollar mark in grosses. But one thing that could have hurt the film is that there was a similarly titled not very good, but still somewhat successful movie, the Neil Simon dramedy Only When I Laugh, which had opened in theaters seven weeks earlier. Bogdanovich would pretty much lose everything by gambling on himself and on Dorothy. Not that he was necessarily wrong to. You can find a fairly decent transfer of the movie on a very popular internet video website, and you can see for yourself the film is rather good, and many of the actors are fantastic, including Dorothy. And after you watch the movie, it's hard not to wonder how much things would have been different for Peter Bogdanovich and for cinema in general if Dorothy Stratton hadn't been murdered by Paul Snyder. Could Bogdanovich, with his new muse, have created more and better movies? 
Could Dorothy Stratton become a movie star she seemed destined to become? Could Bob Fosse make a better final movie than Star 80? We'll never know, but we definitely lost something on August 14, 1980. Peter Bogdanovich would have a comeback of sorts in 1985, after he was done writing his book about Dorothy, when he directed the surprise hit drama Mask, featuring Cher, Eric Stoltz, and Laura Dern. But his final six movies after 1985 would be a successive series of critical and box office disappointments, including an ill-advised sequel to The Last Picture Show, which was made in 1990. But he could never quite shake the ghost of Dorothy Stratton, going so far as marrying Dorothy's somewhat lookalike half-sister Louise when Louise was 20, the same age as Dorothy when she died. Bogdanovich was 49. The marriage would end in 2001 after 12 years of marriage, but they would work together again in 2014 when they co-wrote the comedy She's Funny That Way, which Bogdanovich would direct. The cast list would include Jennifer Aniston, Will Forte, Catherine Hahn, Joanna Lumley, Michael Shannon, Quentin Tarantino, and Owen Wilson and Wes Anderson and Noam Baumbach would help to produce the film. But the movie would only be released in a handful of theaters in August of 2015. It would be the last film Peter Bogdanovich would direct. Before I head out, I wanted to suggest a podcast for you. In late 2020, journalist and film critic Karina Longworth did a season about Polly Platt and her life. For her podcast, you must remember this which I cannot recommend highly enough. Polly Platt was an amazing person, and by the time you finish Longworth's series, you'll wonder why you never heard of Polly Platt before. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk again in two weeks when episode 73 is released. Remember to visit this episode's page on our website, filmjerk.com, for extra materials about the movies we've covered on this episode. The Film Jerk Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for idiosyncratic entertainment. Thank you again. Good night.